<laughs> well, finally, we come to chapter 19. And our whole journey through the book of Revelation, uh, if you are familiar with its structure, uh, has been to get to this point. And if you, if you look at it, and if you remember last week, chapter 19 stands in stark comparison to chapter 18. You remember, and, and they both depict the same event. They both depict when God winds things up. But in chapter 18, if you remember from last week, out of 24 verses, there was only one that said anything positive. All the rest of it was doom and gloom. Chapter 19, we see the exact opposite. It's praise God for this, praise God for that, hallelujah for this, here we are in His presence. It's wonderful, it's marvelous, it's fantastic. We stand amazed. Now how can we have the same event described in such starkly different terms? Well, by now, we've been at this for 27 weeks. <laughs> My, my seven-week series on the seven churches of Revelation. And, uh, <laughs> we, we've come to know that there are how many groups of people in the world? Two. Believers and unbelievers. Chapter 18 was a description of this great event from the unbeliever's perspective. There was nothing good about it for them. Chapter 19 is the description of this great event from the believer's perspective. Totally different, isn't it? Remember, the day is coming that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. And how the knee bows, some will bow in sheer terror, and some will bow out of immense joy unbelievers and believers. This is a great chapter. I'll tell you what, if you think you struggled to listen to me drone on and on through some of this, it was tough preparing some of these messages because they were, they were hard and they talked about uh, unpleasant things and it, it, was, it was just hard for me to put some of those together over and over and over. But now, now we break out. Now we can rejoice. But let me ask you uh, a question. And I, I know you'll all get it right. What is the main theme of this book? The revelation of Jesus Christ, right? The main theme of this book is Christ revealing himself to us, revealing his plan to us, and, and letting us be a part of it. Okay. What is the number one major sub-theme in this book? Now, you may not know this because we haven't talked about it too much yet. The major sub-theme of the book of Revelation is one word. Worship. Yes, who said that? Me. Hey, good for you, Skyler. <laughs> Worship. Now, you may be a little surprised because you were probably thinking about words like judgment and words like end. And, and the major sub-theme of the book of Revelation is worship. The book of Revelation talks more about worship than any other book in the Bible with the exception of the Psalms. Does that surprise you? I bet it does. It's, it, it, it surprised me. And I've read it, I don't know how many times. But I, I, I think we get so in tune to the judgment aspect and what's going to happen in the future aspect, we miss this major theme in there. More about worship than any other book in the Bible other than the book of Psalms. Revelation is a positive book. Remember, it, it's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And for the believer, it's all good. It's all good. Now, we're going to look today not so much to see what's going to happen when we get to heaven, but we're going to look to see what happens in heaven so we can try to emulate it here on earth. In other words, we're going to look and see what the book of Revelation says about 
perfect worship, which is the way it will be in heaven, right? And how we can learn from that in how we worship, albeit imperfectly, here on this earth. I think it's going to be uh, very instructive for us. And as I was thinking about this, you know, the perfect and the imperfect, I thought about uh, Plato's analogy of the cave, if you're familiar with that. And if you're not familiar with that, it, in, a, in a nutshell, what he says is, we're all like people who live in a cave, and all we see is uh, the shadows of people outside being projected on the cave wall, and that's all we know. And we know that there's shadows, we know that there's forms, but we, we don't see the intricate detail, we don't see the real picture, we don't see the whole picture. And, and that's the way we have to approach worship. You see, we read about it in Scripture, uh, we, we can talk about it, we, we try to do it, uh, but we don't see the whole beautiful picture as we will see it when we get to heaven. So this morning, though, we're going to get a glimpse of what that's going to look like. And hopefully it will be instructive for our worship here on this earth. And the first thing we see about worship is that it is totally God-centered. Worship is totally God-centered. And Tracy read that for us. I'm not going to reread it all, but I'll read the pertinent parts as we go through. But if, in, in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1 through 7, it lays that out for us. Worship is always God-centered. Now get this next part. Worship is never, ever, ever about you or me or any individual. It's always about God. If it's not totally God-centered, it's not worship. You can call it whatever you want, but it's not worship. Now I'll show you something really radical. Worship isn't even about the music. I would like to meet the person that coined the phrase worship service for the music portion of the service. Because what that does when we implant it in our minds, yes, the music should be a time of worship, but so should the preaching, so should the greeting, so should the offering, so should the driving into the parking lot be. It's all an act of worship because that's what we're coming here to do, isn't it? To worship. Jesus Christ. So when we bifurcate the thing and we say, well, this segment's the worship service, now this segment's the preaching service, this segment's when the pastor gets into our wallets, we've lost it. Our lives should be about worship. Here's another one. Worship is not about how you feel or about your current situation. And you say, but pastor, if they're coming to repossess my car tomorrow, how can I worship? Because worship isn't about your car. See, Now, I can empathize with you. I've never had my car repossessed, but I, I can imagine it's not a nice, nice thing to go through if you're having financial difficulty, if you're having a, a prolonged illness, if you're dealing with protracted, unpleasant uh, situations in your lives. Th those can all uh, impact you and bring you down, but you can still worship. Okay? Your worship may be different, may be a little more subdued, there may be different ways you express it, but you can still worship God. Because it's not about all those things we just talked about that we get so consumed with, and I just, just as you do, I get consumed with them too. It's about God. Look at verses 1 through 3. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Now in these three verses, we have three great reasons why we can always worship God. The first, we can worship God because of creation. And if you look at chapter 4, verse 11, 
We see that born out. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? For you have created all things, and you're, by your will they existed and were created. Is that not reason to worship God, to praise God? Sure it is. How about salvation? That's another one. Um, chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And we look at that. And we see, and they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. How about that for a reason to worship? Our salvation. Creation and salvation. And now this third one might strike you as a little odd, but we'll work our way through it. Another reason that we can always worship God is because of His judgment. Oh, wait a minute. I thought we were through with all that stuff. No. Because of His judgment. Now look at verse 2. For His judgments are what? True and just. And as believers... Do we need to stand in fear of his judgment? No. We were judged at the cross. We were declared not guilty at the cross. When God called us into his kingdom, he didn't call us into his kingdom to judge us. He called us into his kingdom to rule and reign with him forever and ever and ever. Another reason we don't have to fear his judgment is right here. It is always true and it is always just. No matter how hard we try on this earth, judgment is not always true and it's not always just. You know, I think we have probably the best court system in the world. Is it perfect? No. Do innocent people sometimes go to jail? Yeah. Do guilty people sometimes go free? Yeah. It's not perfect. But God's judgment will be perfect. There will not be one innocent person that goes to hell on Judgment Day. Not one. And there will not be one guilty person that goes to heaven. His judgment will be perfect. So we can rejoice in that. We can take comfort in that. And these three areas, of creation, salvation, and judgment, by the way, perfect judgment, the only person, if you will, that can pull them off is who? God. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what was there before that? Nothing. It was formless and void. So God created, we use the term theologically, ex nihilo, or out of nothing. Now we can create, can't we? I was over at the Brian's house here, Brian Forsland, here a week ago or so, and he's, he's the guy's a master. I just love him. You're a blessed woman, Cindy. He's doing this deck, you know, but it's not just a deck. It's got all these beautiful patterns and everything, and it's, to my eyes, perfect. It's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. But Brian could not create that deck out of nothing, he had to go to the lumber yard. He had to buy the materials. And it's, you get the picture. Only God can create from nothing. That's his territory. How about salvation? Is there anyone that can provide you with salvation other than God? I don't think so. One of my favorite passages of scripture here, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Listen to this. It's beautiful. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. And on it goes. Boy, if that doesn't strike you, I don't know what will. That's what God has done for us. Now, is there anybody else that could do that for you? Of course not. And then, of course, is judgment, and we talked about that. It's true, it's righteous, it's just. Therefore, it's good, and we can rejoice in it. We can give him praise for his judgment. And he tells us here why he has judged so harshly. Uh, for he judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged her in the blood of his servants. And then in that, that next verse, there's a little phrase we want to get. Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up for a time. No. No. Forever and ever. Once God has done away with evil, it's gone forever and ever and ever. We'll never have to deal with it again. And until God does away with it, we will have to deal with it. So that's a marvelous thing for us as believers to look forward to. Now, as we're praising God, and I think I mentioned this last week, there, there is no... Uh, petty human vengeance in this. We're not going to be praising God looking back and saying, aha, they got what they deserved, they should have listened to me. No, this, this time of praising God will be looking totally forward. We'll be so transfixed with him and his presence, all of that stuff will be behind us. It'll be gone. And it's, it'll be a pure praise for our great creator, redeemer. Totally centered on God. The second thing I want us to see about worship from this passage is worship is corporate by design. Worship is corporate by design. We're going to see that as we go along. You know, you hear people say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't, I don't go to church. Or I'm a ch Christian, but I don't like organized religion. I always tell them, well, come to Parkside. We're about as disorganized as you can get. <laughs> you know? But can you be a Christian and not be involved in a church? Well, theoretically, yeah. Practically speaking, I think not. Because you can't worship. Worship is corporate. It was designed by God to be that way. In Psalm 122, verse 1, there's a great verse, and it says to this, and my... My former church we had, this was kind of our motto, it was on our bulletins and everything. And the psalmist says this, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's good theology for a couple of reasons. You should always be glad about coming here. I know, you've got to listen to me after you get here, but still you should be glad about coming here. And notice, I was glad when they said to who? To us, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's always corporate. Um, Hebrews, New Testament verse, we're familiar with 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting the meeting of ourselves together as is the manner of some. It's always us. Now, some people misconstrue that. Let us consider how to stir up one another. You're supposed to stir up one another to love and good deeds and positive things. Not stir up one another to rebellion. Like, okay? I just want to make that clear. Notice verse 4 in chapter 19. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Now how many of the elders fell down before God? All 24 of them. We've ran into these 24 elders previously. It wasn't uh, the eight of them fell down, you know, and the, other, the others did not. It, it wasn't that 22 of them fell down and, and three of them were over here complaining about the music being too loud or the preacher being too long or whatever it is, you know. Somebody's in my seat, that sort of thing. No, it was God-centered. They all fell down in unison 
to worship God. We go on, we look at verse 5, And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God all, you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. So who is to praise God? All who know him. All who fear him. All. Now look at how he describes these worshipers. He's talking about us. Praise our God, all you his what? Servants. He calls us servants. Now it's interesting, this word servants, and, and how it is here, because we don't get it. Just because there's just a cultural chasm between us and the first century. Now we read the word servants and we think of maybe, I don't think any of us are affluent enough that we do it, but we think of people that are hired to, to do housework or hired to cook and a chauffeur and that sort of thing as servants. That's not what we're talking about here. The, 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 the Greek word, I don't know why they did this servants, but all of the translators pretty much did it. But it, it's douloi, which is a plural form of doulos, and it's also the word used for slave. Now, slave, a little different connotation, doesn't it, than servant. It's a little harder. Servant's a little softer. But now, here's an interesting fact. Jesus uses this word in the gospel 71 times, and every time is translated slave. Every time. Paul uses it 30 times in his epistles. Every time, it's translated slave, not servant. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, this word occurs, this douloi. And, and here's how it's, it's translated. The rich, the powerful, and everyone, slave and free. I think a better translation, and who am I to argue with the translators? Nobody. But I think slave fits better here. Because when we read servant, we think about somebody who has options. If I'm doing your housework for you, and I don't think you're paying me enough, I can quit and go do somebody else's housework. I have an option. Now, if I'm a slave, do I have that option? No. But we're Americans. We love options. It's in the Constitution. It's not, really. But God is saying, worship me because you have no other option. It's a command. Praise me. Worship me. Not to worship, not to praise God, therefore becomes an act of disobedience. You know, now, now there are times when because of our circumstances, because of things, we, we, we're sad, we, we're down, we're, we're all that. But we, need to get, we can get out of it. And even then we can still quietly praise God from our hearts. You know, we, we, we can tell him, you know, I don't like this situation. This situation stinks. It's terrible. But I praise you because one day, because of your sacrifice, I'm going to rise above all of these things. So worship is not optional. Now remember, we're looking at perfect worship here. The ideal. And what do we see associated with this ideal worship? There's one word, and that word is right here, hallelujah. We see it four times repeated, don't we? Now, let's take another little survey. Hallelujah is a pretty common word, right? We throw it around a lot. If you were raised in a Pentecostal church like I was, you heard it all the time. It's hallelujah this, hallelujah that, hallelujah, pass the breakfast, you know, whatever it was. How many times do you suppose this word hallelujah appears in the New Testament? How many would say 25 times or more? Nobody would say that. Really? How about 10 times or more? 
No? Well, how, how about five times or more? How about never? How many would say never? You even know what I'm talking about. Are you out there? <laughs> well, my survey failed. Well, here's the answer for you. In the whole New Testament, this word shows up four times right here. But we toss it around so lightly that we think it should be everywhere. Four times, right here. And what's going on right here? The worship of God. Now, hallelujah is merely a Hebrew word. It's a compound word. Halle, praise, Yah, Yahweh, God. Praise God. So it is, does show up in the Old Testament, but guess what? It's never hallelujah. They translate it. And it shows up, praise God. Or praise the Lord. And you find it where? Most often? If not exclusively, in the Psalms. So this is a word associated with praise for God. And it's, by the way, it's always, always, whether in the Psalms or here, an imperative second person plural, which means corporate. All of you praise God. All of you praise God. And an imperative means it's a command. Okay. Third, third thing I want to see here. Invol worship involves the whole person. The whole person. Look at verses 6 and 7. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder, cry, peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Worship involves the heart, the mind, and even the body. What do we see in Revelation chapter 4, verse 10? Our first, one of our first scenes of worship. What do they do? They fall down before God, their body, and they cast their crowns at His feet. And that's symbolically of giving Him what they have. And it comes back to that thing. Do you understand when you participate in the offering, it's an act of worship? whether it's the offering that we take here and it's in dollars and cents, or whether you're offering uh, to, to take your neighbor to the grocery store or whatever it is they need, that's an act of worship that you're doing. You're giving your time, your stuff over to God. They fell down. Now that kind of bothers me a little bit because I'm not a big demonstrative type person. I spent the last two days in a golf cart with Michael Osborne. Now, he joined the country club that I belonged to for, I don't know, eight or ten years. And after eight or ten years, I probably knew eight or ten people. Yeah, I don't know how long you've been there, a year or something. Three years already? My goodness. Okay, I didn't want to start a family fight. The, the point is, he knew everybody there. Well, I mean, he just, everybody knew him. Hey, there's Michael Osborne. Isn't that great? You know, I walked through there. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it causes me a little bit of consternation, all this falling down and raising hands and stuff, you know. Uh, but if, so what I want to make the point here is, so you don't have to strip yourself of your personality. Be who you are. For me, clapping a little bit once in a while or attempting to clap is pretty, dim, pretty far out there. You know, for other people, you know, this stuff comes naturally. If it comes naturally, do it. If it doesn't, don't fake it because it, it comes off fake. You know, but involve your whole self in this worship. Uh, music, sing. You know, uh, get into it as much as you can. Uh, one of the things that uh, 
one of the conversations going throughout you know, at least evangelical Christianity right now is this whole deal of uh, worship team, you know, and I love our worship team, okay, and the congregation. And they're, they're talking about what happens or what can happen is the worship team becomes so professional, so polished, and the presentation is so slick, you know, we have smoke and we have this and we have that, we have all this stuff going on, that it becomes a concert. And the people then don't participate. Now there's nothing wrong with Christian concerts. But the Sunday service shouldn't be a Christian concert. It should be a participatory act of worship. And Steve and I wrestle with this all the time. We talk about it when we get together uh, from, from time to time. How do we put on the best uh, presentation from the platform that we can. We want it to be good. We want it to be without making it come off as, okay, this is us. We're the pros up here doing this and you guys need to sit there and listen. Okay. And we, we wrestle with that because we, we want to put on, do the best we can, but we want to make it participatory too. And so there's some tensions in all this that we just have to deal with. And I don't think we have the answer, do we? <laughs> No, we don't. In heaven. <laughs> in heaven, there you go. Finally, and this is sort of like point number one, worship is reserved for God alone. You look at verse 9, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Okay. John is so smitten with this angel that he falls down to worship him. And we say, well, we would never do that. But we do. Maybe not necessarily you and I, but there are people that worship this pastor or that pastor in a certain sense or this worship leader or that worship leader or whatever you know oh, they're so great they're so this they're so that and none of them I think want that they want you to worship God okay and so do I and so does Steve and then we have this whole marriage supper of the lamb thing and if you think a little bit about uh, Scripture, the Old Testament, and everything we see in Revelation comes out of the Old Testament. There's nothing really new. Uh, we see this imagery a lot, and, and one of the places we see it most vividly is in Isaiah, and when we are finally united with our Lord and Savior. And, and here, here's the language Isaiah uses. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of mar marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up this mountain, the covering that is cast over all peoples and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproaches of the people will be taken away for all time for the Lord has spoken. One more. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. So when we see this imagery of a great feast, and if you're familiar with, with the Jewish tradition, their marriages are big deals and big feasts, and uh, it's just a great, great time. And that's kind of the way God is, is saying it's going to be for us. We are God's betrothed, right? We are his bride. And we're waiting for the day when we're united with him. Now again, there's a cultural gap here, a little bit. What do we think of when we're betrothed? We think of being engaged, right? And an engagement isn't a final act, is it? No, it's a time when supposedly you have the option of backing out. That was not true in the first century. When you were betrothed, it was as good as being married. It was as, everything but, but going to bed together. It was a sealed legal deal. And you don't have to look any further than one of the most familiar stories in the Bible. You look at the birth of Christ in Matthew chapter, chapter 1 or 2 there. And what do you find out? Joseph was all distraught with Mary who was his betrothed. They were not married because she was found to be with child. What was Joseph going to do about it? He was going to divorce her because that was the only way out of a betrothal. 
So, when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we became betrothed to Him, and the engagement ring, if you will, was the sealing of the Holy Spirit, which is irrevocable. So, we are His betrothed, we're just waiting for the wedding feast. Now, think about it in human terms. You're betrothed to this absolutely beautiful woman, or this stunningly handsome guy, but you've got to wait a year. And you're, you're with them more or less all the time. And can you imagine the anticipation that's going to build to that day, to that time? And when the time finally comes, wow. You know, it's going to knock your socks off. Well, that's kind of the way it is for us. Before the foundation of the earth, we were sealed. Now, we came into the picture cognitively when we recognize Christ as our Savior. And now we're just waiting for that day when we enjoy that great time of unification with Him. So why do you worship? You answer that question. Where do you worship? Everywhere. Do you fully give yourself to worship? I don't know. I don't know. I'd be a liar if I said, yeah, I do all the time. I'm always fully engaged in worship. No, I'm not. But I should be. Okay? We all should be. We are Christ's betrothed, and one day we will attend that great wedding feast. And what a great day that will be. It will be marvelous. One more question. Will you be there? Because attendance is by invitation only. You see. And if God has extended the invitation to you to come into his kingdom, I would urge you to say yes. And then you can look forward to a chapter 19 experience versus a chapter 18 experience. And I, I would just encourage you this week. Read the two chapters again. Look at the difference. Think about what it's going to be like to participate in chapter 18 as compared to participating in chapter 19. And then praise God because you are participants in chapter 19. Lord, thank you for this uh, great chapter. Thank you, Lord, for a picture of what true worship looks like. Thank you, O oh God, that you have called us into your kingdom and that your calling is irrevocable. Thank you that one day we will be with you forever and ever and we will be able to worship you in spirit and in truth for eternity. And Lord, if there be anyone here who you are speaking to right now, I just encourage them to say yes. Yes, Lord, I want to be a chapter 19 participant. I confess my sins to you and ask you to be my Savior. And then, Lord, give them the assurance that it's a done, sealed, completed deal. And we ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.